variation in inheritance and evolution in animals and plants. We'll start by looking at variation. The term variation refers to the slight individual differences within populations. All living things change and evolve from one generation to the next, and as they do so, more variation is introduced. But how does it happen? Most variation is controlled by the genetic material we inherit. Charles Darwin was a 19th century naturalist who studied variation among plant and animal species during a five-year voyage around the world. Darwin's contribution was to provide the big idea, the overall scheme which might explain the complexity of life and how it came to be. Change was at the heart of his theory. Gradual changes from one generation to the next as the fittest and the best adapted survived and prospered, passing on these favoured characteristics. But how were these changes passed down from one generation to the next? We now know that variation within a species is caused by the environment and by genetics. Environmental factors determine how an organism grows or develops. Genetic variations occur in sexual reproduction because genes are inherited from different parents. Mutation is another cause of variation. Organisms can reproduce either by sexual reproduction or by asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction does not introduce variation. Only one parent is involved, and asexual reproduction relies on mitosis cell division, which produces identical copies of the original cell. That means offspring have exactly the same genetic information and are exact copies, or clones, of their parents. Examples of asexual reproduction in plants are sending out runners, as in strawberries, or side branches like busy lizards. Vegetative propagation, such as forming tubers, bulbs or rhizomes, like in potatoes, crocuses or irises, taking plant cuttings or grafts to grow into new plants, and growing a few cells into a complete specimen, called tissue culture or cloning. In sexual reproduction, there are two opportunities for variation to be introduced. Two parents are involved, supplying male and female sex cells, sperm and eggs in humans, and pollen and ovules in plants. They give rise to a new individual by fusing randomly, which introduces variation. Variation is also introduced because sexual reproduction relies on meiosis cell division, which means that each offspring receives slightly different genetic information. That's why we resemble our parents, but are not the same as them. Well, that's the end of this section on variation. Variation leads on to inheritance. Inheritance is the passing on of genetic characteristics from one generation to the next. This was first investigated in the 19th century by Gregor Mendel. As you watch the next clips, make a note of how characteristics are passed on. Mendel was a monk, later abbot, of the Augustinian monastery in Brun, a thriving provincial town in what was then a part of the Austrian Empire. Between 1856 and 1863, he raised nearly 30,000 plants, crossing varieties that demonstrated clearly identifiable characteristics, all the while counting the number of times each characteristic appeared in succeeding generations. What Mendel observed is, for example, if you cross a pink and a white flowered pea plant, then all the offspring in the next generation are pink. So what had happened to the white? And that was the mystery that he started with. Now what happens if we cross two pinks in this generation? Well, that's when the famous ratios pop out in the next generation. You get three pinks and one white. 
Now, why is that the case? And Mendel was able to be clear that somehow the white had been masked in the middle generation, but it was still there, ready to pop out at the end. And this is what we would now call the pink being dominant, the white being recessive. The essence of Mendel's idea is that inheritance is based not on fluids, but on particles. And of course, he worked on peas. He worked, for example, on round or wrinkled peas. His amazing breakthrough, really, was to find that it seems simple, that when you cross a round with a wrinkled pea, you don't get a pea that's partly wrinkled. You get a pea that's round. Um, that pea, if you uh, make those, those peas together, then you, in the next generation, get the wrinkled peas back again, quite unchanged. So that inheritance is a matter of separate units that are passed down the generations, quite distinct from that which they produce. Mendel had uncovered a crucial aspect of inheritance, the fact that somehow an individual's characteristics, the color of hair or eye, for example, are passed on through the generations, sometimes showing themselves in a particular individual, sometimes not to be seen again for several generations to come. It's the same with breeding dogs. Every characteristic in a dog is controlled by a pair of genes, one from the mother and one from the father. Often the gene from both parents is the same. Two genes for short hair will make a short-haired puppy. And two genes for long hair will make a long-haired puppy. There's no conflict. But when the genes are different, a system comes into play to work out whether the long or the short hair gene will set the hair length. Some genes are stronger than others. They're called dominant genes, and the weak ones are called recessive. Dominant genes tend to hide the effect of recessive genes, sometimes hiding them completely. So if the gene for long hair is completely dominant, a puppy will have long hair, whether it inherits the long hair gene from either one of its parents or from both. The only way it can have short hair is to inherit a short hair gene from its father and a short hair gene from its mother. This means that the effect of recessive genes is often covered up. But the recessive genes are still there and they're passed on from one generation to the next. With genes for every characteristic of an animal, thousands of pairs of genes are matched up when a baby animal forms. The end result is a complex mix of characteristics from the mother and characteristics from the father. We saw that genes are responsible for characteristics inherited from parents. Genes can be dominant, which means that characteristic is more likely to be apparent, or recessive, which means that characteristic is less likely to be apparent because it is masked by a dominant gene, although it may appear in later generations. There's more about inheritance in the Higher Tier Signs programme. That's it for inheritance. Next, the theory of evolution. In 1859, Charles Darwin published his theory of evolution, based on observation of variation and inheritance in the natural world. As you watch the next clips, note down the evidence that supports Darwin's theory. Before we go into Darwin's theory itself, we need to be clear exactly what he was trying to do. He was trying to explain not just the origin of species, but also the fantastic variety of species that have ever existed on this earth. And that brings us to the first kind of evidence, the fossil evidence. If we look at a sequence of fossils through time, we can see changes in features that have led from one animal group to another. This fossil is a reptile belonging to the group that we think mammals evolved from. This specimen is about 240 million years old. Here are the chewing teeth, and they're relatively simple. It also has a long stabbing tooth here and nipping tooth at the front. If we look at the modern tiger's teeth, we can see here that the chewing teeth have evolved into very strong prong-like structures for chewing meat and bone, as well as having the stabbing teeth and nipping teeth at the front of the mouth. 
So these gradual changes through time in the teeth and all the other features of the skull actually demonstrate to us that evolution has happened in the fossil record. And what Darwin did was actually find an explanation for how it happened. Darwin came up with the idea of natural selection. Very briefly, here's how natural selection works. In every species, there's variations. Some individuals are big, some are small. Some are fast, some are slow. And some of that variation is inherited. So in every generation, most of the children will be born to those animals that have what it takes to survive and reproduce. And those children will tend to inherit what it takes. So as the generations go by, the average animal in the population gets a little bit better. It may seem hard to believe that animals as complicated as these could evolve in the way that I've been saying. But that's because we're not very good at understanding the immensity of time that's been available for it all to happen. Domestic dogs and horses have evolved by artificial selection in a few hundred generations. But life has been going on this planet for about 4,000 million years, and that's plenty of time. When an animal reproduces, its DNA gets passed on to the next generation. That very DNA that made it successful at surviving and reproducing in the first place. Every now and again, rarely, there's a random mistake in the copying of DNA called a mutation. And mutation, together with the shuffling of DNA that happens in sexual reproduction, spreads the variation through the population. Now, if a variation is advantageous, say it gives a predator better eyesight or something, then that's the DNA that will go forward to the next generation. So it's changes in DNA that drive evolution forward. One of the more surprising things that Darwin suggested in his theory of evolution was that humans and chimpanzees were somehow related. Now, if Darwin is right and humans and chimpanzees are very close relatives, then we should expect to see that their DNA is very similar. Scientists can extract DNA from cells and then cut it up into fragments using special chemical techniques. When these fragments are separated, they can be used to work out the genetic code contained in the DNA. This means that the DNA from different species can be compared. The order of these fragments of DNA correspond to the order of the different letters of the genetic code. It's much easier to analyse these results on the computer. The top line of letters here is what my own genetic code looks like, though it's only a small part of my DNA. We can compare this with the genetic code of a chimpanzee here along the bottom. The two sets of DNA are very similar. In fact, there's only one change here in the stretches of letters that we have here on the screen. If we looked at all my DNA, we would see that 98% of it is identical to that of a chimpanzee. This is very strong evidence that humans and chimpanzees have a common ancestor. The fossil record suggests that this common ancestor was alive five million years ago. The main evidence for the theory of evolution is that the fossil record shows that animals have changed and evolved over millions of years. Over time, most animals and plants have become well adapted to their environment by natural selection. DNA analysis shows that all animal species share a large percentage of identical DNA, so they must have common ancestors. There's more about variation, inheritance and evolution in the Higher Tier Science programme. That's the end of this section on variation, inheritance and evolution.